right, so we are on to chapter four, common sense and scientific inquiry. So what is the relationship between common sense, the common sense world, common sense problem solving, and specifically scientific inquiry? Um, let's get into this, and I should maybe note, just as uh, something to be aware of, think about, that there does seem to be a little bit of a um, a uh, a similarity here with the later Wilfred Sellers idea of the manifest and scientific image, which is about the relationship basically between the common sense world and the scientific view of the world. I don't know that that was influenced at all by Dewey's various comments on uh, the relationship between common sense and uh, science. Other writers uh, around this time talked about that too. Anyway, that's a famous idea, so I'll just just want to point that out. But let's get into this. <clears throat> so let's begin. Upon the biological level, Dewey writes, organisms have to respond to conditions about them in ways that modify those conditions and the relations of organisms to them so as to restore the reciprocal adaptation that is required for the maintenance of life functions. So there's a restatement, a restatement of some ideas that we've uh, come across earlier, uh, especially in the biology chapter. There's uh, an indication here of uh, maybe coevolution. I don't know if coevolution was a, uh, a thing that was talked about at this time. Um, but definitely it became important later that the organism co-evolves with its environment. So reciprocal adaptation, that's a really um, useful phrase, interesting phrase to note. So organisms respond to the conditions about them, modify those conditions, and the organism's relationship to those conditions to try to restore reciprocal adaptation required for the maintenance of life functions, for the continuance of life, for preservation, reproduction, and all, and all of that. Human organisms are involved in the same sort of predicament. Because of the effect of cultural conditions, the problems involved not only have different contents, but are capable of statement as problems, so that inquiry can enter as a factor in their resolution. Right, so we've uh, just discussed culture in the previous chapter. So humans are a little bit unique, or depending on how you want to state it, perhaps very unique because we've developed language, we can state our problems as problems so that we can focus on specific aspects of them, analyze out particular um, elements, and try to focus on those, clarify the problem through verbal statement. So we don't only have different problems because we have this um, very much uh, richer culture, but we also have different tools at our disposal through language to deal with problems. For in a cultural env environment, physical conditions are modified by the complex of customs, traditions, occupations, interests, and purposes which envelop them, right? So physical tr uh, tr conditions are transformed through all of these things, customs, traditions, all of that. Uh, modes of response are correspondingly transformed. They avail themselves of the significance which things have acquired and of the meanings provided by language. Obviously, rocks as minerals signify something more in a group that has learned to work iron than is signified either to sheep and tigers or to pastoral or agricultural or to a pastoral or agricultural group. Right, so the signification of rocks is different depending on the, um, I was going to say the level of your culture. I don't know if that's... Uh, um, kind of a biased, a prejudiced way of putting it, but the, um, you know, the state of your culture, the development of your culture, I don't know, all these things are maybe problematic, but 
differences in culture provide differences in, in meaning, right? Or here, signif uh, signification, significance, since we're talking about non-verbal things, we're talking about rocks, which contain minerals, which can be used to make metal if you know how to do it. But if you don't know about that, then rocks don't have that significance. Uh, the meanings of re related symbols which form the language of a group also, as was shown in the last chapter, introduce a new type of attitudes and hence of modes of response. I shall designate the environment in which human beings are directly involved, the common sense environment or world, and inquiries that take place in making the required adjustments in behavior common sense inquiries. So we've got the common sense environment or the common sense world and common sense inquiries, which are about directly solving problems that come up in the course of living. So this is the common sense world, common sense inquiry. As is brought out later, the problems that arise in such situations of interaction may be reduced to problems of the use and enjoyment of the objects, activities, and products, material and ideological, or quote-unquote ideal, of the world in which individuals live. So common sense problems are about how to use and enjoy the various objects that are provided by our physical environments and cultures. Going on, such inquiries are accordingly different from those which have knowledge as their goal. So in common sense inquiry, we're not trying to gain knowledge. We're trying to figure out how to, we can use this thing, what it can be best used for, how best to use it, how we can best enjoy it, those kinds of things, which are not, um, the goal of those is not about knowledge. And Dewey says, the attainment of knowledge of some things is necessarily involved in common sense inquiries, but it occurs for the sake of settlement of some issue of use and enjoyment, and not, as in scientific inquiry, for its own sake. So knowledge is, um, mediatory in common sense inquiry where the end goal is use or enjoyment but in scientific inquiry knowledge per se is the end goal <clears throat> that's the claim here the argument here in the latter so in scientific inquiry there is no direct involvement of human beings in the immediate environment a fact which carries with it the ground of distinguishing the theoretical from the practical um yeah just checking if we we're talking about knowledge here or scientific inquiry per se um i think it means in scientific inquiry so we're not uh, directly involved in the immediate environment, I think, in the sense that we are out of common social situations. We're not trying to solve a problem immediately in the environment. We set off a bit of the environment as separate, right, in a laboratory or in other ways. We kind of remove ourselves from the practical situation of the ongoing flow of life in order to experiment on some specific part of the environment. And so this is the ground for the dif distinction between the theoretical and the practical. So this seems to be the theoretical um, in distinction from the practical seems to be related to this distinction of science from common sense inquiry, scientific from common sense inquiry. The use of the term common sense is somewhat arbitrary from a linguistic point of view, but the existence of the kinds of situations referred to and of the kind of inquiries that deal with the difficulties and predicaments they present 
cannot be doubted. So just acknowledging that the term common sense is a bit arbitrary. You could call it something else, but the distinction that he is drawing here cannot be doubted, or it um, should be clear enough. Uh, they are those, so those um, uh, situations, uh, I think now we're talking about, yeah, talking about common sense situations, right? So they are those, those, uh, those common, sensu uh, common sense situations are those which continuously arise in the conduct of life and the ordering of day-to-day -day behavior. They are such as constantly arise in the development of the young as they learn to make their way in the physical and social environments in which they live. They, are <clears throat> they occur and recur in the life activity of every adult, whether farmer, artisan, professional man, lawmaker, or administrator, citizen of a state, husband, wife, or parent. On their very face, they need to be discriminated from inquiries that are distinctively scientific or that aim at attaining confirmed facts, laws, and theories. So in order to develop for, as a uh, young person, to develop into an adult, in order to solve problems in your job as a farmer or carpenter or information technology specialist, um, to solve problems in pol as a politician, as a husband or a wife or a parent. You don't need um, scientific laws, right? You don't need scientific facts. You don't need scientific theories. So these are common sense inquiries. When you're solving problems in those realms, in those domains, you're, is common, what Dewey is going to call common sense inquiry. So they need, so those kinds of problems need accordingly to be designated by some distinctive word and common sense is used for that purpose. Moreover, the term is not wholly arbitrary even from the standpoint of linguistic usage. In the Oxford Dictionary, for example, is found the following definition of common sense good, sound, practical sense, combined tact and readiness in dealing with the ordinary affairs of life. Right? So the ordinary affairs of life. And then Dewey says, common sense in this signification applies to behavior in its connection with the significance of things. So behavior in connection with the significance of things. Again, this is what objects mean to us, to us behaviorally, what they point to, what they indicate, when he's talking about the significance of things. So how should we act in the face of the practical things of daily life? Uh, and I'm going to read this paragraph, then... Um, it's a fairly good stopping place after this paragraph. Uh, so there is, to continuing on, there is clearly a distinctively intellectual content involved. Good sense is, in ordinary language, good judgment. Sagacity is power to discriminate the factors that are relevant and important in significance in given situations. Right? Kind of like talking about wisdom, figuring out what is actually important in this situation. What do we actually need to pay attention to? What can we ignore? Sagacity. It is power of discernment. In a proverbial phrase, ability, ability to tell a hawk from a hernshaw, chalk from cheese, and to bring the discriminations made to bear upon what is to be done and what is to be abstained from, in the ordinary affairs of life. That which, in the opening paragraphs, was called the mode of inquiry dealing with situations of use and enjoyment is, after all, but a formal way of saying what the dictionary states in its definition of common sense. I don't think there's too much to say about this so far. 
Um, but I'm going to pause here because um, there will be a longer section coming up next. But yeah, like I said, there's not too much that's difficult here. Just introducing the distinction between common sense and scientific inquiry and dwelling on what he's going to mean by common sense, which is dealing with problems in the ordinary affairs of life, problems of use and enjoyment of the things of the world, the things in our situation. And there is an intellectual aspect to this. It's not unintellectual, right? Common sense is not really anti-intellectual or anything like that. Uh, it does involve judgment, wisdom, right? We have to be able to discern what is important in this situation. Um, what should we deal with first, second? What can we ignore? All of that. So anyway, just a little bit of an introduction to this, the topic of this chapter, and we'll expand on that in the next video. That's all for now.